We're going to continue in our studies in the book of Romans, uh, Romans chapter 3. Uh, we've studied so far down through verse 26. And uh, to begin this morning, I'd like to, for us to get the, uh, the portion of the chapter that Paul begins explaining justification by faith. Uh, I want to read the, the, that part of the chapter together, beginning in verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of their law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So justification is by His grace through His redemptive work on the cross. And so God has made provision for the world. Uh, God has made, uh, through Paul, we have the understanding that justification by faith from Adam until now is made possible because of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul goes on in verse 25, talking about his redemptive work, whom God set forth to be a propitiation, which means all satisfying sacrifice, through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So Christ's righteousness took care of all the sins in, in the past that God forgave when believers in time past believed God and God counted it unto them for righteousness. The cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ was the basis for that in God's mind in time past the sins would be paid for on the cross through faith in Christ's blood. Verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, Christ's righteousness, that he might be just, God might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Uh, today the gospel through Paul is uh, a different gospel than, than what men were given to trust in in time past. But the gospel today, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, uh, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, Christ died for our sins is the unique message given to Paul to preach during this dispensation of grace that when Christ went to the cross, he paid for the sins according to prophecy, Isaiah 53 and other passages, uh, to save his people, his nation. But through Paul's message, we learn that his redemptive blood wasn't only to pay for the sins of the nation of Israel, but were, was also shed to pay for the sins of the world that during this dispensation of grace, God interrupts the prophetic program and makes possible justification by faith to be available to the people of all nations, not through Israel as a channel of blessing, as in time past under the Abrahamic covenant, but by faith in the gospel and just having the word of God uh, for anyone to, to read the message for the world today that Christ died for their sins, they can trust that and be saved without the law program, without without, again, Israel being that ch nation of priests or channel of blessing for salvation to be offered to the Gentiles through that priestly nation. So today, Paul's message is justification by faith is available to all men today, and it's not just for Israel. And as we read down through the passage, verse 27, where is boasting then? So the issue is, 
if works are a part of salvation, or ever was a part of God's redemptive plan, then men could boast in it. But the point is, it's through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross that salvation is available to sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but salvation is available to all because of the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whereas boasting then, verse 27, it is excluded. So Paul makes it very clear. He's not making a case for uh, salvation in time past by faith plus works. He's making a case that works are not possible under the, uh, with God's redemptive plan of justification by faith. And that, uh, that through a free will, men have the choice to believe or not believe. And if they believe, and trust in God for His mercy and His grace. He, in different programs, has had different options for men to trust in Him to be saved. And again, the gospel in this dispensation is different from the gospels of time past, but justification can only be by faith, according to what Paul says in these verses. Let's look, uh, con continue reading. Boasting is excluded by justification by faith. Uh, through salvation, through the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ, through His shed blood, uh, there's no boasting that, that any believer at any time can have before God in heaven because all salvation is through the redemption that's made possible through Christ's cross work. Uh, so he goes on to say, verse 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? of works, nay, but by the law of faith. So the law of faith has been consistent. God hasn't changed. His redemptive plan has been the same. It's only through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that salvation or redemption is possible to anyone, uh, especially to sinners, right? So verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? So when he says, is he the God of the Jews only? We have 39 books of scripture that Paul had in his day. There were 39 books of scripture that showed that Jehovah was the God of the Jews and that salvation was available to all who trusted in him and had the faith of Abraham. So he asked the question, is he the God of the Jews only? Verse 29, is he not also of the Gentiles? The answer, yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith. Now, in the dispensation of grace, circumcision is not an issue. And in the body of Christ, there's no circumcised. All men are uh, in Christ are part of the same body. So circumcision is not an issue in the body of Christ or in this dispensation of grace. But he asks the question because he's making a statement that has to do with justification now being offered to the Gentiles through a, a God's secret pur purpose, through the mystery program revealed through Paul, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, that God has interrupted Israel's prophetic program. He's, he's holding back his wrath that was prophesied would follow the cutting off of the Lord Jesus Christ, as in Daniel chapter 9. But the, the next event on Israel's prophetic uh, calendar was the wrath of God in the tribulation period. God is holding back that wrath, and he's holding back the glory that he wants to reveal. He's holding back uh, the fulfillment of the promise of the Abrahamic covenant uh, through the new covenant that he's going to make Israel that righteous nation and the channel blessing that he can, his, his name can be uh, glorified in that nation in the earth and he's going to reconcile the, the government of the earth through that millennial reign, during that millennial thousand year reign uh, that uh, is talked about in the book of Revelation and Matthew 24 and several other places. So, uh, seeing it as one God, notice verse 30, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Now you notice works aren't mentioned in that verse. Now, verse 31, 
Do we then make void the law through faith? What's the issue? Justification by faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? And he says, no, God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So the Lord Jesus Christ came. He fulfilled the law. The law was given. Uh, remember what Paul said. If you go with me now to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy 3, verse 7. Paul said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Go to Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians 3, we're going to look at what Paul said in Galatians 3 about the law. Uh, begin reading with me in verse 21. Galatians 3, 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. If there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scriptures have concluded, or you could say the law hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before the, but, verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed, Christ. Verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So, the law was Israel's schoolmaster. Paul, again, in this section, talking about justification by faith, we began in verse 19 and 20, and, it, and Paul said that the law was given that every mouth might be stopped and all the world may become guilty bef before God. Paul says the lawful use of the law in the book of Timothy uh, the law isn't made for a righteous man, but to show people that they're sinners. So the number one purpose of God throughout the ages has been to show man that he's a sinner. Uh, Solomon said the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Number one, in order for someone to be saved, they need to fear God as the judge of the earth. To fear God and recognize he's the judge of all men. Um, the point is to fear the judgment of God against sin, which leads men to realize the wages of sin is death. I need to trust in God. I'm accountable to him, the creator. I need to fear him for salvation. And then the issue is after salvation, the person is to appreciate God's grace and mercy for providing salvation by faith, the faith of Abraham, and therefore love God and serve God out of love and gratitude. Uh, serve God because of His mercy, uh, because He's a good God. And serve Him whatever program you're under. And in time past, they were under the law program. And so they were to appreciate the salvation that God promised to Abraham and his seed, who believed God. And then they were to submit to God under the law program as a nation, as a performance system. Believing Israel, the law should have taught them that they needed a Messiah. And when Christ came, they should have been uh, looking for him as a nation to bring in the new covenant. But rather, we have two groups of people, two classes of people. You have one group that uh, didn't, didn't believe they needed God to save them from their sins, the self-righteous group who thought that the law made them uh, above the law as a people and that they were, it's because they were such a great people, God gave them his law to show the world that they were so righteous. That group did not believe that they needed Christ to make them righteous. They believed they were righteous in themselves. Then the other group were the sinners who recognized they were sinful. The law taught them that uh, as a schoolmaster, they needed a Messiah, a Savior, to save them and their nation from the curses that the law brought upon them and were looking for the Messiah, the Savior, to save that nation and them from their sins. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 8 now. And we're going to look at verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Now, we're, I want you to consider with me that during the Lord's earthly ministry, what he taught about the forgiveness of sins. And 
the issue with the forgiveness of sins that we've been studying in recent weeks is that when Christ, the propitiation of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, was for the sins that were passed through the forbearance of God. I want you to see what Christ taught about forgiveness because a lot of times people are under the understanding that Israel's sins are not forgiven in time past and they won't be until uh, they, uh, the Lord returns at His second coming and then the times of refreshing are when individuals as well as a nation receive the forgiveness of sins. That's not the case as we've already looked at in our studies. We're moving on, but I just want you to appreciate justification by faith that Paul taught wasn't unique to Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ taught justification by faith also. And I want you to see that by these passages. There was this woman who was a sinner. She came into the Lord's house. She was a sinner in the sense of Judaism. The Pharisees would have looked down upon her that she was not uh, as righteous as they were as Pharisees and probably shouldn't have entered into their house uh, without an invitation by, the, by Judaism and by their practices. They would have separated from sinners. But if you continue reading in the passage with, with me, you know the story. She brought the alabaster box in and stood at his feet, the Lord's feet, behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. Yeah, he didn't know the Lord could read his thoughts. He wasn't a believer. For one, he didn't believe Jesus was the Christ. Look at verse um, 41. This was a, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My my head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he saith unto, or he saith unto her, thy sins are forgiven. They are forgiven. You remember he said to the thief on the cross, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. There, he told her, and, and it's important to see here, the reason he said he forgave her and that uh, is because her heart, she understood her sin problem, and because of her realizing his forgiveness was available to her, a sinner, he forgave her because her heart exercised faith in him as the Messiah. And verse 49, And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. He didn't require a work of her. The issue was he saw her heart of faith, and he said, Your faith has saved you. You're forgiven. You're free. Um, go in peace. So I want you to turn with me now to Mark chapter 2. And I want to ask the question, who was apt, who then in the household that we just read about was more apt to preach the gospel to sinners? Would it have been the woman with the alabaster box or the men gathered who were the same mind as Simon? And the answer is the self-righteous are less likely to offer the gospel of the grace of God, justification by faith alone, to sinners. They're less likely than somebody realizes it's, it's not their righteousness. It's not the self-righteousness of the individual that God is looking for in order to grant salvation. But it's the realization, the heart, the, the godly sorrow and true repentance. The idea that sin is an issue, it's a problem with God, 
and trust in God for his mercy to provide forgiveness. That's the always been the issue with God with regard to salvation. Now in the different programs throughout the ages, throughout the Bible, there are different programs to walk in for sanctification, the walk of the believer, like the law program, very different from being in the dispensation of grace and not being under the law program as are in our walk to serve the Lord, uh, sanctification and so forth. Um, so go with me to Mark chapter 2, verse 16. And then the, the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, and they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? Then Jesus heard it. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So the issue with the Lord in his, in his ministry was he came, he's only going to be able to help those who are sinners. Uh, Christ came into the world, Paul said, to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Christ came into the world for that purpose, to save sinners. The self-righteous aren't sinners in their own mind, and they don't need a Savior. So that's the, the issue. Justification by faith is the only way that God can offer salvation in any dispensation. During the Lord's earthly ministry to, de to deliver Israel, from the curses of the law that the, 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 the law had brought upon that nation, where did he find more open hearts to hear the gospel, to repent, and be converted? From those who were trusting in themselves to be righteous by keeping the law, go to Matthew chapter 7. You have two classes of people in Israel. One class was righteous by keeping the law, but they didn't have faith. And they were antagonistic to the Lord during his earthly ministry, they didn't think they needed a Savior. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For, what, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Now, this is the context of this statement. The self-righteous opposed to those that know their, their sinners. Verse 4, Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. So th this is the context. In the Who's the hypocrite in Israel? It's those that believe that they're not sinners because they keep the law. Like Paul said of himself, I was uh, blameless under the law. Now, was Paul really blameless? The issue with that statement is that if two or more witnesses don't witness a, a person sinning, then before the nation, they're blameless. So there's an issue before other men living under the law program, and then there, your reputation, you're never caught in an act, but then there's the issue of the heart, and Matthew 5 is all about explaining, the Lord explaining. The issue with God is that God looks upon the heart. Look at Matthew chapter uh, 13 now, verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? The Lord at some point in his ministry began to address the multitudes with parables to teach doctrine instead of just plainly stating the doctrine of justification by faith. And there's a reason for that, and we're going to look at that. Uh, they ask him, Why do you speak to, to them in parables? Verse 13. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. I want you to think about this in the context of what we've already read. There's that part of the nation, self-righteous by the law, they don't think they need a Messiah to save them from their sins. They have the law to prove that they're righteous in themselves. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Notice, for this people's heart is wax gross. It's a heart issue. And their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed. The issues of sin, they've convinced themselves that they're righteous. Sin, their conscience, is not a problem anymore for them. They've turned it off. 
um, they've closed their eyes, they've closed their ears, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should, and should what? And should be converted. That's the issue of salvation. And notice, and I should heal them. What's the healing in this verse? The healing is the forgiveness of sins for the individual. So, God, the Lord Jesus Christ did, did a lot of miracles. And the Pharisees had a problem with him saying, your sins are for, forgiven you. Get up, take your bed, and, and walk. The point was, who can forgive sins? God is the only one who can for, forgive sins. God didn't heal anyone who didn't have faith in him as their Savior. He didn't heal those that were sin, sinners that were going to hell because they didn't trust in God for his mercy to make them righteous or to have the righteousness of faith. Also, the righteousness of God is what it's called. And we'll see that later in the book of Romans when we study chapters 9 through 11. Go to Matthew 18 now, verse 21. So who should be forgiven under the law? With God, the issue with forgiveness is an acknowledgement of their sinful condition and a response of the heart to trust in God for his forgiveness. And that person is more apt to forgive others, realizing we all have the same sin sickness. And that's the point with being saved. You realize you're, you have a sin nature problem and you need God to save you from your, from your sinful condition. And that's why you trust in him to uh, his finished work on the cross and that alone is because you can't save yourself by doing any amount of good works or righteousness because your sin nature is the problem. Matthew 18 verse 21. Then came Peter unto him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Uh, till seven times he's trying to get a number how you know what's reasonable to forgive somebody who's constantly doing things against you verse 22 Jesus saith unto him I say not I say not unto thee until seven times but until 70 times seven now what's what's the issue with the Lord when he says that he should forgive this person oh, 70 times seven 490 times what's the issue that he uh, is the Lord's thinking about. And the issue is, if you haven't trusted in God for, to be, save you from your sins, then you're not going to be apt to be able to forgive another person for sinning against you. And that, when, when I've heard many people, I think, in error preach that during Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nobody receives forgiveness of sins because of a, a statement like this. If you forgive, then God will forgive you. The point is, if you don't trust God for forgiveness of sins, you're not going to forgive others. That is the issue that's being dealt with here. And we'll read on. Jesus saith unto him, until 70 times 7, verse 23, therefore is the kingdom of heaven. Now, what's he talking about? Salvation. He says, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon one was brought unto him, who owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded that him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Now notice verse 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldst not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? 
You remember what Paul said in, in Ephesians, uh, uh, that we should forgive others as Christ has forgiven us. That's this same issue that the Lord's talking about. Verse 34, And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him unto the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So the issue is having a heart attitude of forgiveness because you esteem yourself to be a sinner also, as opposed to the pride that comes and arrogance from being self-righteous and having no compassion. Now we have examples of this. Look in chapter, uh, same chapter, verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take it uh, take thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or more witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear the, them, tell, them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever thou shalt bind in the earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. The point here is, with forgiveness, the attitude should be to try to forgive, try to restore, try to reconcile someone who sinned against you because you know your own sinful condition. And that's the issue with, with this the heart attitude of forgiveness. And there are two groups in, in Israel. One, their zealousness and their, uh, for the law and their pride. They don't see themselves as sinners. And there is no attitude of love for a sinner, a lost sinner. And that's the point that the Lord's trying to make in this passage. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 1. This is important because we're backing up in the chapter to show what issue the Lord was dealing with in this chapter. Now look at verse 1 of Matthew 18. At the same time, there came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now what's this, bear in mind, what issue is, are the disciples thinking of? Who's greatest? Okay, who's got the most righteousness? Who's, who's the, the most to be praised in the kingdom of heaven? Look at verse Two, And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except you be, what? Converted, salvation, and become as a little children, as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's saying this to his disciples when they ask him, Who's greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So the issue of the two parts of that nation, the self-righteous, the Lord is trying to make sure that they are humble in their heart and realize the issue isn't how great we are as uh, sinners who have trusted God to save us from our sin problem and have hope of everlasting life. The issue is how great God is to provide salvation. And he says... Um, Verse 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The issue is, who has been forgiven the most, loveth, loves the most. The issue is recognizing your own sinful condition and need of God to make you righteous. And whoso shall receive one such little child of my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend... Now notice... The Lord's looking at these people and the crowd's coming to him. Who's coming to him for salvation? The Pharisee group? The self-righteous group? No. The group that's coming to him for, as, a, as Messiah to trust in him for forgiveness are those who recognize their sin problem. So he's saying, if, notice uh, this passage, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and that he should be thrown, uh, drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. Sin problem. For it must needs to be that offenses come. But woe to that, to that man by whom the offense cometh. If you reject somebody to give the gospel to them because you esteem them to be too much of a sinner, and I'm thinking about the disciples here that sometimes people came to him and he sent them away, uh, 
the man whose, whose son was tormented and, and they couldn't cast the demon out of him, but the Lord had given them power to cast out demons. The issue is the heart attitude, and he's, he's dealing with that here. Verse 8, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut it off. And this is, that passage talks about better to cut off your hands and feet than sin and be cast into everlasting fire. Um, and drop down verse 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of the Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come, and here's the verse, verse 11, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. God's looking at sins of, the, of everyone, unbelievers, and he, his desire and we'll read on. How think ye, if any man have a hundred sheep, or one of them go, be gone astray, he not leave the ninety and nine, and go into the mountains, and seek that which is gone astray. This isn't just somebody that's backslid. This is talking, he's talking to somebody that has faith, but they're not saved. And if so be that he find it, I say unto you, that he rejoiceth more of that sheep, than of the ninety and nine which were not astray. Even so it is not, here's a, notice this verse, even so it is that it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. I want you to see the consistency with salvation, the difference between that and the issue of the walk of the believer. So there's justification, which is by faith. Sanctification, the walk of the believer, is to understand who and what God's made you in Christ and let that be who you see yourself to be. You're a saint of the Most High God. You're a child of God. You should live like someone God has made righteous should live.